there. This is Mickey Cope, and I'm the Wandering Road, as you all know. I told you we would be doing coyotes this week, and uh, George is here again. George went to the meeting the other night and observed. Uh, I understand you all had a rousing time. I'm sorry I didn't get there. Would have been interesting. But I thought, that, I thought I'm just going to throw out a couple of things here that I think you should know. The Aztecs gave the coyote his name Coyote, C-O-Y-O-T-I, meaning God's dog. God's dog. That's interesting to me. Native Americans of the southwest of Mexico, Mexico called him the old man. And in another one, I found that his, his call at night is the, call, is the song of the gods. So I don't know what we're so mad at these animals for. They're just being who they are. And um, with that, I'm going to give this over to George because George has, has done as much research as I have. And we just want to give you some things that you can work with. George, welcome right. back. Hey, I'm looking forward to it. I, I am love too. being here. Um, what I find is really fascinating is that people are so afraid of an animal that they, they're so closely related to the animals that live with us for over 14,000 years. They're, these animals are, share our rooms, they share our beds, they share our couches. We mm -hmm. feed with them, we eat with them, we travel with them, we play with them, and yet coyotes and wolves strike fear into humans. And I've never been able to understand that. And what was fascinating was when Back in the 70s, when I was studying the Eastern Coyote and some work that was done uh, with Ray Coopinger over at, at Hampton College out of Univ in Massachusetts, they were finding road kills and doing necropsies and found that they were filled with carrion because of the maggots are in there. Yeah. And so they could see that they were scavengers, they were more scavengers. Um, so they've been around for a long time. Opportunistic. And, uh, absolutely. And, They've been with us, for, they've been around here for such a long time, and it was really shocked me because I've been away from it for about a decade. That when I was speaking to somebody from Coyote Project, that I realized that four decades later, and we're in the still the same situation with education, ed educating the public to understand that these animals are not a threat to us. Mm -hmm. they, they, they don't want to compete, they don't, there's no reason for them to compete. They actually probably help us in many, many ways. Um, and as we go into this, you'll, you'll see how we have a role that we can help them and help ourselves live together without these confrontations. And sometimes the going of killing coyotes are actually creating a bigger problem for us as far as um, uh, the animals that they eat, that they ah. actually can help us out. Yeah, I was noticing the food that they eat. There was a whole list of it in, in here uh, on some of this. I don't think I've got a handy here. Well, you know what's fascinating is that, that yeah. raccoons, raccoons, during the, um, I, I, I was an ambulance driver for the SPCA out of uh, Massachusetts uh, many years back. That's where my early part of my career. And we had a drought season. And we had a high uh, amount of pavo and distemper going around because there was so much drought that sick animals, or sick raccoons were drinking out of water and Pets were drinking out of these puddles, of these Ooh. water watering holes. And we had an outbreak uh, of Pavo distemper. And where was this? Up. This was in Massachusetts. Massachusetts. This was back in the, uh, in the 70s. And be I know this because I was involved with capturing some of these animals and, and um, or taking animals away from certain areas uh, that, that were sick so children wouldn't get bitten. The coyotes would take care of these animals for us. Really? They didn't they get parvo or no. anything? No. Are they capable? Probably, but their immune system seems to be different. The, the raccoons, from what I understand, uh, again, I'm not a veterinarian, and it's been a while since I've been disconnected, so I'm talking about my situation at that moment, was um, cat, they carry both canine and feline diseases. So cats huh. and dogs were getting sick. So our pets that we're trying to protect from these wild animals are actually being saved because of these wild animals by keeping the raccoon population at bay. And wow. raccoons don't have any problem moving into the inner city and living with us. 
But um, that said, uh, we, I'm hoping that we can do today is talk about um, how coyotes, if you understand your own pet, if you understand more about dogs, and you look at your dog, you might look at your coyote a little slightly different. And I thought that if we did a little summary about what we talked about last week for folks that didn't catch the show last week, uh, help catch up or remind folks that did watch about the rules of how animals learn. Yes. Okay. We know that there's three rules we talked about with training any animal. And when I say training, we're talking about environment by itself is training it. Uh, um, animals learn both positive and negative at the same rate. They can learn bad things just as easy as they can learn good things, mm -hmm. depending if it gets rewarded. Right. Okay. So That's one of our things. Exactly. And that's one of the things that may be affecting us with, with the population of coyotes moving in closer and closer. A behavior that gets rewarded will increase probability. That's right. So if a behavior gets rewarded, the chance of it happening again goes up. It could be bad behavior, such as mm -hmm. we talked about the jumping puppy. Mm -hmm. Puppy jumps up on you and you pet it, puppy's going to continue jumping. And we'll see in some of the pictures I have later is puppies come up because they want to smell your breath. Mm -hmm. They want that, that interaction. And, we'll, and I have some great pictures of showing this. Um, then the behavior that does not get acknowledged, a jumping puppy, and I'll use the jumping puppy again for, for, to help everybody remember that jumping puppy that jumps up on you, and if we just keep talking, the puppy stops and goes away, gets nothing for it, it won't continue. Unless it's been rewarded as a pup, and now it's four or five, six months old, and it's still jumping. Now you say, oh, I'll just ignore it, it'll stop. No, it won't. It's already been rewarded. Ah, okay. See? And the last rule, the third rule, is a behavior that cannot be ignored must be redirected by That's teaching an incompatible behavior. Right. And I'd like to add a fourth rule, and then I'd like to show you how this incorporates with the coyote situation that we have going on. Okay. The fourth rule is, if I remember, because I always said this differently than the actual quote was, is in nature there is no, let's see, if I want to read this right, so make sure I get it accurate because I want to give credit to the person. In nature there's neither rewards nor punishment. There are only consequences. And that's by Robert Greene Ingersoll. Um, I've always said the be there's no right or wrong in nature, consequences. Same idea. I mean, the, the, the intention was to make, to make the statement that if an animal, a wild animal, gets too close to humans, they end up getting into trouble. Mm -hmm. So um, if an animal um, rushes head, remember last week we talked about puppies, that when you're looking at a, a a litter of pups, and there are some puppies that are going to come running up to you right away, and the other puppy's going to stop and think about it, and then, and then there's going to be others that stay behind. And I talked about the ones that stay behind are the ones that are probably going to survive longer than the other two. So if we look at coyotes that way, the animals that stay behind and stay away from humans are going to survive longer than be the bold one that's coming right into the neighborhoods and looking at you and getting, well, why is that bold one happening? Why is that happening in nature? In, in dogs, it happens because we've, it's genetic part of it, and we reinforce it, um, and there's no consequence for doing it mm -hmm. to a puppy. But there is a consequence, say, for a wild pack of animals, like whether it's wolves, coyotes, or even kits, kits or fox. Mm -hmm. I love that they call baby fox kits. I yeah. love that sound. If you get a young animal that just boldly runs up to something, it's probably going to be eaten. Yeah. Or you're hit by a car. Right. Or mm -hmm. something. And, and so it's not in the best interest of that creature or that species or that litter to, that's why the high death rate, mortality rate for young animals weans them out so the stronger ones to survive and what happens with the stronger ones they live long enough to reproduce mm -hmm. and what's the purpose of an animal on earth is reproduce. to reproduce to keep the continuations of the species and it's the same the same as humans exactly that's right so what different is is when we go to dogs then and, and when we do the dogs um, the rules change because we some people get a dog and um, they will I want to have puppies. So I, I love my dog so much, I want to have more puppies. So what we do is we have 
huge overflow of dogs in our society mm -hmm. compared to um, what we're able to sustain. Coyotes, wolves, fox, they don't do that. They sustain what they um, reproduce based on the area that they live in, the area that that's their home, and how much food is available to them. That's with all animals, or all, even the birds, the bears, everybody okay. in nature. And even in politically incorrect term is primitive cultures, but <laughs> I would never forget <laughs> my studies when I was a young man about the Yanomamu Indians in the, the rainforest of South America, that they will only give birth once every two years. Really? Humans. Because for two years they would raise that child before they would get, they, did they end up pregnant? Yeah, but we don't want to talk about what they did with the, because they couldn't sustain two children under two years of age. They could wow. not care so for I them. I wonder if that's where China got to one child. We'll avoid China. <laughs> what that numbers is a variety of different things. Okay. But, but um, um, so you see that in nature, it'll, it'll clean itself. It'll, it'll, it'll cleanse itself. It'll maintain. The problem comes from human intervention, and we throw it out of whack. It gets yes, thrown out of I whack. I was reading that. Tell them how that throws them out. Well, with, let's, if we look at... Um, um, at Look at the, the, the dog population in our society, how that's completely thrown out of whack as far as the numbers running around. And um, dogs living on the street, what's their life expectancy? Very low. And why do dogs end up in the street? They end up in the street because, um, and whether we want to accept it or not, people abandon dogs. They abandon dogs, they abandon cats. Um, uh, many years ago, I did a, um, a talk called... Um, um, it was about dogs. Um, I, I lost thought of what the name of my talk was. I apologize, but it was um, reusable, recyclable dogs. Well, we don't. This one didn't work out. We'll just get another one. Well, we don't want to bring it to the shelter because if they bring it to the shelter, they have to be euthanized. So what are you going to do? You're going to let it loose. I know a gentleman. Hoping somebody will pick it up yeah, and take it yeah. home. But then you think that way, somebody else thinks that way, and yeah. somebody else thinks that yeah. way. And, and I know a gentleman... And nobody out there picking them up. That's right. And I know a gentleman that purposely took a whole litter of pups that he couldn't sell out in Oregon to the desert and let them loose in a small, outside of a small community and just let them go. They'll, they'll, they'll survive. Well, they don't survive um, if they're lucky to make it through the first year. And, and, and what happens is if they... Uh, they can't hunt. They've lost that hunting ability. Some occasionally you're going to get an animal that'll go hunt and um, and a squirrel and kill a bunny. Sometimes they'll eat it. But you have to remember, these animals are also well fed. And the reason I say that is, animals that are well fed have more energy to uh, express while hunting. So that if they fail, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. They go home. If if they're pets, they go home and eat. If they're scavengers, if they're living in the wild, um, they've lost their ability to really hunt. So the dogs, the pet dogs that are hunting, are hunting out of sport. The feral dogs that are hunting don't, they may not have the proper drive to, to do the hunting appropriately, to successfully. Okay. Even in wild animals, the success rate for each attempt of kill is limited. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can see that on any of the Nova shows that exactly or the nature shows, any of them. Exactly. And what happens is they can't expend that much energy. energy. Yeah. So they limit after a certain time they right. have to know they give up and they may go without food for a day. Mm -hmm. Okay. But pet dogs that run loose, they go home and eat. Feral dogs that go out, they have to start scavenging for food and garbage dump garbage dumps or in the city trash cans and things like this. And now that opens them up to all kinds of diseases. And uh, mange is the number one killer. Um, mange will uh, basically, it's a mite that affects the animal's skin and the dog loses its fur. And now whether it's a dog, a squirrel, mange get into a squirrel for winting, squirrels den together, mm -hmm. wipe out a whole family of squirrels if mange gets into that nest. Wow. Because they lose all their fur and they can't survive the cold temperatures. Yeah. So um, as we go in, 
to this a little bit more deeper, I, I like to express the fact that I like to share um, how animals learn. Because knowing how they learn, whether it's from the parents or it's from us, um, will help everybody understand that, that these animals are no different than your dog and cat as far as desire to want to survive and desire to stay away from confrontation. Why do dogs bite? <clears throat> That's a subject we'll touch on briefly. Um, about um, the numbers of bites every year. Yeah. But we were talking there earlier. I said I, on one of my things here that um, uh, in Los Angeles, they, there's 3,000 coyote, uh, coyotes living in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And nobody knows it. Yeah. And you were reading something about... The numbers of, the number the of dogs n living in Los Angeles? The number of dogs living in Los Angeles yep. are... They, they're estimating 50,000 do 50, street dogs. Street dogs. Street That's dogs. street dogs, That's not dogs pets. Without street homes. Street yeah. dogs. That's right. And we'll get into um, the, the difference between feral dogs and coyotes okay. as we go on. But let's look at some, um, oh, there we go. In 1999, we'll touch this, it's on the screen for everybody to understand what we're talking about here. 1999, the SWAT teams had to go out and, uh, and they had to hunt um, and kill animals or capture them because the funding went away for ACOs, animal control officers, to be able to help maintain the dogs. The old days we called them dog catchers. Mm -hmm. um, but which you're looking at the numbers there, 200,000 residents were bitten. At least 47 vicious dogs and hundreds caught every day. And they had to shoot them if they couldn't capture them. They tried to capture them with hava hat traps. So he mainly catch them. Because you don't want to shoot animals in the city, you know, if you don't have to. But some of them were so bad. But look at that. Look at the amount of bites. 200,000 residents were bitten. That's an amazing number. Do you know how many, um, it's hard to get bite counts on coyotes, but do you know how many deaths there were? And we won't even talk about deaths on, on, uh, caused by dogs every year. Uh, pet dogs. But do you know how many, um, uh, what the number is for deaths and coyotes on reckon? I think it's two. Two. One in 1981 yeah. in California, and the other one was not too long ago up in Nova Scotia. Okay. And they suspect that the reason that that, that, that happened was because uh, there was somebody out in the woods alone, and they were feeding. And that area has been known to feed coyotes. So when an animal assumes that you're a food source, now you're driving them to you. you just like the bears in Yellowstone. Right, right. They tell you, everywhere you go, don't feed the animals. Don't right. feed the animals. There's a reason for that. Ah, it's only a little peanut butter sandwich. Yeah. You know, it doesn't take long. Opportunist and the behavior that gets rewarded will tend to increase in probability. Right. So let's look at food. How... We'll go back a little bit and let's look at dogs for a moment, okay. all right? Let's look at the first video clip we have. This video clip that we have is my puppy at, um, at around 14 weeks. One of them is, um, we have a videotape of a, of a puppy playing. And, um, oh, it has musical accompaniment. Wow. This is Pamerlin, and he shortly came home. He's about 10 weeks old. Constant motion. Constant playing. Energy. Why? Because he's being fed. He's got proper nutrition at home. So we're out in my training yard right now. I'll call him to come into the house. And my pups have limited time uh, 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 freedom in the house because of house soiling and stuff. But when he's in the house, this is what he likes to do. Doesn't. Do <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs> Now, if you watch this, he'll slide into the kitchen. He immediately comes out because he's been taught not to go into that kitchen. And um, he stays on the carpet. He's been taught not to go in. This is him outside now. Now we're taking this energy and we're putting it into a play training session. I'm actually incorporating this energy into um, um, a connection with me, bond with me, be a part of me. Let's do this together. Right. We talked about that last week with the walking. And this is what we end up getting is a dog that really, really likes to watch and be focused, okay? Now, the next video, if we can see the next video, is how I'm using food 
I'm going to use food to teach him how to do a new behavior. And one of them is, is, is a sendo. This is teaching him to walk beside me. And he's been taught to stand on that black bucket. Okay? Now, I taught it using food. And I taught him, look at the attention that I'm getting from him. Yeah. He's 15 weeks old here. And he was told, touch. And he puts his feet up there. We talked last week about yes, we body did. awareness. Right. Now, he'll make a mistake and watch the correction that we get. One of the mistakes he makes is... It just makes me laugh. But I rewarded it because I'm actually teaching that as place. So what I did to him, he goes, oh, you're going to do place? And he, so I rewarded it, even though it was an accident. Right. Now, if he steps off, he doesn't get food. So I use food, food in my training yeah. because it's a primary source to survival. It's a primary yep. reinforcer. So that would be the same with the coyotes. They're getting, they're getting a food source with the bird seed. Yes. They're getting food source from the dog food being left outside. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. What else? The garbage. They could probably get into the garbage, I would assume, if you don't or have they, the lid on and you or just they eat lay it on. Animals that down. come and eat the garbage. So they come yeah. and eat oh, the animals that eat the yeah. seed. They come and eat the animals. It's a food source. Right. It's, I've, I've watched the whole thing. And, and look at the attention that this puppy is giving me. And this is how we play. This is, so now, he wants to go to the bucket. Why does he want to go to the bucket? So he can get a reward. Right. So how did I correct it? He doesn't get the reward for going to the bucket. Watch. He, see how we, a behavior that gets rewarded. Well, I was on that bucket before, so I talked a little bit more with him, but I want him to get used to understanding that no is not a bad word. If I'm going to say yes, I'm going to say no. Now, did I use a lot of it? Yeah, a little bit as a trainer. Um, I could have, but it doesn't matter with him because it doesn't mean anything negative. Can you see? Yeah. It just means do something else. There he goes again. I want to go to that bucket because that bucket, I focused on that bucket. And now, now I'm it. using the bucket as a, a distraction. Right. I'm purposely healing him past that bucket so I can show him that you only go to that bucket on command you get the reward. If you freely run over to the bucket, you don't get the reward anymore. Right, right. Because he's got it. He's learned it. Right. So now he has to learn to go on command. So how was he learning that? He was learning it by watching me, interacting with me. How does a, a coyote, how does a young coyote learn? From its mom and dad or, the, or the siblings because the, 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 sib the, yeah, the siblings that were born this year like the, in June, they get mm -hmm. born in June, and by, they're already fully grown and hunting on their own by, by fall. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those siblings- Not completely on their own. Well, yeah. no, they're still with mom and dad. Right, but yeah. But when that next group of kids come along uh, at the following June, they're not only learning from their mom and dad, they're learning from the siblings also. And aunts and uncles, if you aunts will. Aunts and uncles, yeah. yeah. They're actually, yeah. They're actually they're actually brothers and sisters of the next yeah. generation, but it's called aunting. Aunting? Yeah, uh -huh. that's the term. It's in the wow. primate term, you have animals that will help handle the babies and stuff. And what it does that's is true. teach the next generation how to be a mummy. Yeah, that's true, true. So they have to learn to be a mummy. Anting. Okay, I got it. Yeah, for, depending on where you're from, anting, anting. <laughs> okay. But do you understand that that's how it's passed down, is from the next generation? Cool. All right, I got that now. So the babies learn... He, he was really focused on me. Right. He was really aware of where we're going to go. We have another videotape, if we could see it, of him. I was doing um, a quick session. It's a very, very brief video of, and shows the attention. Watch this attention he's giving me. This is another training session. See how he jumps off again. He's still in the learning training stage. Now, this is my favorite part. Watch the attention this dog is. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Huh? What are you doing? <laughs> He's watching everything you're doing. Yeah. Yes. Go touch. Good boy. <laughs> How high can he jump? You don't let puppies jump high. Okay. All I'm doing is high enough to make him body awareness. Okay. I do it below the shoulder level. Okay. That's it. Because he's going to jump that height when he plays and stuff. You saw him bouncing around. I just, all I did was I taught him to do the bucket first. 
And once he got the bucket down, then I put him on the other side and put a jump between him. So we, in order for him to get to the bucket, he had to go over this piece of PVC that was laying on the ground. Okay. So he learned to do the uprights. So he's learning by participating and watching. And watching, could you see it? Mm -hmm. So the young coyotes watch their parents. And they go out hunting with them early. They may not participate, but they stand off in the background and watch. watch. And then they get to bring the food back to them. Okay. And both parents hunt. Yeah. Not just yeah. the female. Wearing dogs, the males don't hunt. No. They will not supply food for the puppies. But females, um, male wolves and coyotes will. That's what you were talking about with the koi thing. Yes. Why the survival rate is so slim with the koi. And we'll go into that. Okay. Um, so do you see the learning, a yeah. behavior that gets rewarded? Now, when he went onto the bucket and then he jumped off, I didn't reward it. I didn't scold him. I said, nope. That's what I want. And I use the term, now that he's older, I use mulligan. It's a golf term that means do over. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, my friends get a kick out of me when we do something. I go, mulligan, the dog knows exactly what it means, and he runs back to where we were because we're going to do it again. He's now learned, not by me showing him mulligan, 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 but just by saying it, and we go back and repeat it by repetition. He just said, ah, I know what that means. It's how we learn English. Coyotes learn by watching the parents. We say outside this, yeah, I know, somebody's there, we're going to leave. Make sense? Mm-hmm. That's like, um, I think we have the end results now of um, an agility videotape. This is Merlin at 10 months of age now. It's, <laughs> I love playing with my dog, can you tell? <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> so what you saw was he was left to say, remember in the puppy, I sent him over, sent him over, right. sent him over. And then he had to learn to wait, and I walked away from him. And then I got about halfway. He had to come to me a couple of jumps, and then he had to go ahead of me a couple of jumps. So he's learning that no matter what, there's jumps, keep going. Don't come to me. You're not going to get anything until this is all over. So now we get away from the food, and sometimes the activity itself becomes a reward. There might be a toy after the end, at the end of the, of the session, or there may be food. Oh, so he doesn't know what he's getting yet. That's right. Okay. And he has to, and, and I don't feed him every step of the way. I periodically feed him. It's random and variable rewards. Well, when coyotes are hunting, they don't get fed every time, do they? No. It's random and variable. They don't know what they're going to eat from one day to the next. Right. And how much they're going to have. So they have to always be on the search for food because they don't know when their next meal is going to be. That's random and variable rewards. And they got a varied diet. Very, yes, and they have to in order to survive. Yeah. And we talk about the size up here. We talk about it's really hard to estimate weight of a dog. When you look at people, people tell you all the time, oh, I have a 105-pound shepherd. It's not a healthy shepherd if it's 105 pounds, unless it's been bred to be a giant shepherd. A good working shepherd should be lower. They should be more agile. Even Merlin's on the big side for his breeding, for his line, but he's very agile. It's in his lineage. Um, I have another female Bouvier at home that's 60 pounds. Same breed. He's 90 pounds. She's 60. He's three inches tall, and she is. And he carries his weight better, but he's very agile for, for a big dog. When you look at a coyote, especially in the winter, they look huge. They're probably 45 to 50 pounds. And you'll hear people estimate them to be 65 pounds. Okay. But they have a hard time judging their own dog as well. And what's the benefit of having a coyote? The, 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 the ones out west are maybe 35 pounds. Okay? Yeah, but what are they? Less, in yeah. the, grass, the grasslands, they're eating small game. As they move to the north and the northeast, they're eating larger game. They might go after sick deer. Sick deer. Right. Are they going to be capable of taking down an adult deer, a healthy deer? No. I don't know. No. I said no. You know? And said no. So they, are they not doing us a favor by taking out sick deer? Are they not for hunters? Are they not getting healthier deer to reproduce? No. And to populate? They're killing off the sick, so they're not reproducing. Right. Right? Yes, you're going to have only the healthier to, to um, the bucks, will, but what about the does? You don't want a sick doe giving birth. No. No. So, as we talked about the comparison between dogs and, and coyotes, uh, there's a lot of similarities. 
is the difference is is that dogs have been domesticated with us for 14,000 plus years and they've lost their ability to hunt where coyotes need their ability to hunt and if we kill off the parents now we have these young juveniles with no no teacher no teacher no guidance no teaching the difference between um, um, well there's no right and wrong and it's yeah. the same in a in a human situation yeah yeah we can look at the Romanian kids, are out on the the Romanian out kids. yeah they're out yeah. running yeah without proper guidance the um, what do yeah. you, you call them, the latchkey kids yeah yeah, yeah. That was me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you came out all right. <laughs> but but you understand that that, yeah. that if you kill all the if you say I'm going to get rid of all the coyotes in the area and you just take the parents, yeah. the youngsters are left to fend for themselves and they're going to make the wrong choices. They might survive, they might not. If they make the right choices, they'll survive. If they won't, they won't. But what happens is when they start making these wrong choices by coming in depending on us feeding them that's encouraging them to keep making the wrong choices right they have to be taught and we'll get into hazing we'll finish up with hazing they have to be taught that he being around humans is not healthy for them that's okay. not normal if you question what normal is normal coyote behavior coyote and wolves rather stay away they'll stay on the outskirts they'll stay out of the area because they don't want the connection now the Arctic wolves, Arctic wolves don't show fear of humans because they don't run into them. Yeah, they don't know what they are. And there's no negative connected with them. Right. There's no shooting them, well, unless they go purposely hunting, but they're not going to go way up in the Arctic to do this. They're doing it in Alaska and lower parts of Canada. But um, the idea is there are animals in the world that have shown no fear, all species of humans, if they've been isolated away from humans. or if they've been encouraged to come and feed the bears in Yellowstone, the elk of Yellowstone, the bison of Yellowstone, all the animals of Yellowstone where the human population is coming through and actually feeding them. Well, not so much today, but they used to do that yes. all the time. Yes, but there's that food. Back in the Your primary 20s. reinforcer, right? Yeah. Reinforcer, I mean. Yeah. So, um, I think no. that we, I think that's all the, um, uh, videotapes of, of, the, of the dogs we have. But what I'd like to do for a second is um, we touched on feral dogs on the population explosion. What I'd like to do now is, is go back to the dog's situation with dog bites. And how many claims are made every year for dog bites? Do you have an idea? Any idea? No, the numbers? I have no idea. I think we have a, a graph to put up on the a chart to put up so everybody can see it. Since, um, if you look at the, the years uh, from 2003 to 2011, in 2003, the number of claims were 16,919 dog bites. Claims. That's claims. How many don't get claimed? How many don't go to the emergency room or have an insurance claim? These are just insurance claims. So look at the number in 2003, then look at the number in 2011, 16,292. It dropped for a little while there and went down to 14,000. Uh, and we're not even talking about the money side of this. We're just talking about um, uh, the number of bites that are being claimed. I believe the actual number of dog bites a year is something like 4.5 million. Million? I believe that that's the, uh, the is that number worldwide, that I have. or is that here? To the United States. Just for the United States? Yeah. And, and, um, whoa. There's another chart. Here's another statistics there. there. It's, yep, there it is right there. According to the CDC, researchers based data collection during 2001 2003 concluded that dog bites 4. million Americans per year. 4.5 million dog bites a year. And these are dogs usually that we know, that know us. These aren't strange dogs. These aren't dogs out in the street, necessarily. Majority of bites happen to home do ho dogs right, in right. the home. Children get bit. Yeah, my son got bit. Yep. From Children, the next door neighbor's dog. I mean, just next door. Yeah. And where did he get bit? What part of his body was bitten? We were on the, living on the Air Force Base. This mm -hmm. is on the Air Force Base. Um, right here. Right in the face. Oh, we weren't yep. sure he had an eye or not. What do you think the face? How old was he? Well, Robbie wasn't the problem. No, how old, was, how old was a child? 
Robbie was five. And why do you think he was bit in the face? Because of the kid that he, the dog didn't like came running up behind him and the dog was was actually going for the other kid uh, and Robbie was in the middle. Okay, well, dogs, children get bit in the face more than any other place yeah, because it's right at the mouth level. Right, right. So more deaths happen to children under five years of age. The majority of the bites happen to children under 10 years of age and usually uh -huh. boys. Now, the old oh, statistics usually boys? are usually boys under 10, huh. getting the trouble with dogs more. And why are these children getting into trouble with the dogs? Because they're left unattended, more often than not. I was standing there when it happened. Yeah, but a lot of cases, children, well, we, we grew up with, our generation grew up with Lassie and Min Tin Tin and mm -hmm. Timmy and was it Cubby? Isn't that his name? The little? Yeah. Uh, um, they, these dogs ran with these kids and, and I grew up I grew up with my dog taking care of me. My dog was my babysitter in the 50s. Yeah, we had a dog too. Okay. A collie. Not a collie. A spaniel, cocker spaniel. Cocker spaniel. And, and sometimes they become the companion for the child. But I, in 1996, I wrote a book, I wrote an article called uh, Microwave Dog Training. <laughs> and Newcomb. Well, the purpose for this was the fact that we were expecting things quicker. We wanted everything faster. And I went to the article because in 1980, um, I had a little child, a little four-year-old, ask me if I wanted a cup of tea. I wanted to have a tea party. I was visiting. Aww. And I thought that was cute. She wants to have a tea party. Yeah. And she walked over to the imaginary sink and took a cup and went, Psh! walked over to the other side of the kitchen and on the counter was a microwave. She opened this imaginary door, put the cup in, shut it, went beep, 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 beep. Walked up to me, looked me straight in the eye, put her hand on her hip and went beep. <laughs> went back to the imaginary microwave, took the tea out and said, be careful, it's hot. This was, in 1981, this was a little girl's vision of a tea party. Where did she learn that? Mom and dad. Mom. Mom. That's how mom made her tea. Tea. So there again, generation learns from generation. Mm -hmm. If somebody doesn't like coyotes and they feel that they have the right to kill them, that gets passed on to the next generation. generation. It's, our, our, it's our duty to teach the next generation that it's not necessarily always the best way to go. So during the- um, We late, haven't learned that lesson yet. We, you, you just never give up. During the 1970s and early 1980, I was teaching wildlife education for the Boston Zoological Society, and I taught inner city kids about um, um, wildlife that they would never see, but then I specialized one year on just local wildlife. I went to a school one time, and I had a sack with a big Bernie's python in there. And you could see all the kids getting wiggly and giggly and stuff because I had the sack. You always knew what was in there, right? So everybody's screaming, so I, I'm not, before I take the animal out, everybody has to calm down. I said, how many people are um, af afraid of snakes? And all the hands went up in the air. I said, how many people, are, kids are here afraid of dogs? A couple of hands went up. How many children in here have been bitten by dogs? All the hands went up. I was stunned at the amount of hands. It looked like every hand in the room went up. It may not have been, but that's the way it looked from where I was standing. And I said, how many have been bit, bit by snakes? Not a one. So we're afraid of snakes by the way they look. Uh huh. And yet an animal that has been known to bite us, known to injure us. We bring into the house. We, with open arms. And I love dogs. I would never do any, I'm a strong advocate for dogs. I'm, I am an um, expert witness in two states uh, for dog cases which I don't do anymore. I'm not interested. I gave it up. Um, it was very difficult and stressful and um, time consuming and heartbreaking. Um, and I had a little child, one of the cases that really did it in was a little child lost her nose, half of her nose Ooh. from a dog, from running up to a dog and, and hugging it. So we have to educate children how to approach, how not to approach dogs, how to ask permission. We also teach children that leave coyotes alone. You know, if we're going to do the hazing, we do it as adults. We don't do it, teach the children to do it. Okay. So we have to teach our children. 
And these are the school kids who are afraid of snakes. They've never even seen a python. When I took them out, they were in awe because he was over 10 feet long. So, again, we teach, we teach, we teach. Look at these statistics that we're seeing for dog bites. It's absolutely amazing. I want to show you some pictures of my internship I did at a place called Wolf Park. And first time I went, I attended as a dog trainer. It was a dog training organization called the National Association of Dog Obedience Instructors. We had a conference at Wolf Park. And what we did was we spent a weekend there learning about the different behaviors and so on. And the first picture is with me and Shatan. This, sh this Shatan means hawk in, in um, I think it's Cheyenne. <coughs> Excuse me. And look at the greeting I'm getting. He's five weeks old. And he can't wait to get up and, and lick my face and smell my breath. Okay. And now what is that about when they want to smell your breath? What is that? It's a f identification. But what do wolf puppies do as soon as they see an adult wolf? They go up and, and they start oh, that's muzzling. Right, they do. And what happens? An adult male wolf will immediately regurgitate. An adult male wolf will regurgitate on greeting a puppy. Adult dogs won't. No, they won't. I'm not going to. <laughs> but you saw the reaction that you got. It's identification. Work with zoo animals, all, all the animals that, that got to know you by the smell. Okay? Smell is one of the best ways to, to, to right. look at it. Okay. <coughs> Here's a picture with Shatan. And this other wolf is uh, um, same age because they were, born, they were bred at the same time, but from two different females, and, um, which is rare that the uh, beta. A uh, wolf will reproduce unless there's enough food source. But she snuck off with her boyfriend in the bushes, away from Alpha, and um, and they had a little party. And <laughs> so these two, <laughs> this is Sh Sh Shatan is the uh, is the um, gray, and uh, Apollo is I call him a pillow because he turned out to be a big fluffy little guy. Is the black. And uh, what is what is the one on the right there? Our right, the I'm, black one? Yeah. Yep, okay. that's a wolf puppy. That is a wolf that's puppy. That's a polo, yeah. The other one is a coyote? Nope, the other one is a wolf puppy as well. Okay. Okay, right. this is a wolf center. This is where I'm oh, doing my, okay. yeah, Sorry. and this is where I'm doing, that's okay. But you see, I'm sitting on the floor, on the ground with them, and letting them associate. They're not domesticated. These animals are not domesticated. The research, what we do is, um, the puppies are taken out early before their eyes open so they can be associated with human beings. So when they open their eyes, humans are nurturing and taking care of them. And somebody's job is to live with them 24 hours a day. They sleep with them. They, uh, their bed is on the floor. The, the wolves are all over them. They feed them. They care for them. And they never leave their site except if they have to really, you know, go eat or do something. And somebody else goes in. A second person is in there with them. So, And the reason for this is that we can do the research or they can do the research at the ethology, ethology center. Um, to understand wolves better by watching the pack interact, interact with each other. I think there's a, uh, another photo here of when he's 10 months old. He's learning how to, uh, we're working together. I went away, uh, that p other picture, they were 13 weeks of age. I went away and came back for my internship. This is in January, believe it or not, uh, late January, early February, um, that I am now working with, I, I adopted this wolf uh, and I was doing some comparison between the way dogs and wolves learn. And what was happening is um, um, it was fascinating to see that they were willing to learn to a certain point. If they wanted to oh, do the really? job, they would do it. Okay, but uh, um, you saw with, with Merlin, he was very eager. This wolf is doing it, and one of the rewards I used with him was chapstick. He seemed to find out whatever works for an animal. I wasn't going to use food for him so much as chapstick. <laughs> he just liked to lick it. So um, he's learning to do is we're doing body awareness. See uh -huh. him on the two planks, yeah. and we slowly separate the planks until eventually he has to work on one. Okay. There's another picture where he caught me off guard here, and and shows you the interaction. Now you saw Merlin with me, paying right. attention to me. What are you doing? What are you doing? He would do the same because it's like, come on, what are you doing? I want to do more. So you keep your training exercises short. What was I doing this for? I was doing it to compare how a wolf learns compared to a dog. A dog grows up, and, um, and there's a term called um, neotonic, I believe. I'm trip, trip myself up here uh, with the word. And 
um, it means to, they never mature. And Neil would be, yeah. Yes. And, and so um, I had to vote down to make sure I, I, I pronounced it properly, but they're, they're constantly immature. Where a wolf, you see, that, that, you see the first picture of that puppy wolf, the shape of his head? Mm -hmm. If you look at that, if we can pull that puppy a picture up again, you see this muzzle is short, you see yeah. the eye, where the eyes are, they're more closer to the front, and the, and the, and the head is dome-like. And then if you look at the other picture where he's uh, licking, smelling my ear, um, look, how, look at the difference in the dome of the head, look where the eyes are more to the side and the muzzle is much longer. Now you look at dogs, all right? So if you look at a wolf at, at um, five weeks of age, Okay, and see the head shape, and you put an adult wolf at ten and a five-week-old age a puppy, or even a four-week-old puppy, a meal night, um, um, at a scale of one. The dogs never make it up that scale. The dogs always stay under five. Hmm. Okay. Look at your pugs. Yep. The eyes are in front. Your short nose. More baby-like faces. Peak knees. A lot of your lap dogs have baby facial features. Human baby facial features, they don't mature physically, and they and adult wolf, uh, dogs don't mature to the level of um, a wolf. Okay, does that make sense? Yep, yep. So, after a while, you think, Oh, wolves will make great pets. Well, not necessarily, because um, uh, you, even wolf hybrids don't make good pets because they don't want to do something, they don't do it. I think we have a picture of um, me working with teaching a, um, a wolf hybrid mix. He's three years old. Uh, when they tried to walk him on a leash before, he would drag the owner all over the place. There he is. And um, again, this is February. What a difference in days a day makes, huh? Look at yeah. me with a sweatshirt before, and now here I am. So he really doesn't care. He has no connection whatsoever. He doesn't he care. He sees something out there. He, he just doesn't want to look at me. He's at the end of that leash. And if he's on the end of that leash, see how the leash is tight? Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to pay attention to me. Now, the next shot, and, and there's a series of shots, the leash is going loose. Um, this is the end result after moving away from him. What I do is when the leash becomes tight, if we go through the next couple of shots, I'm going to the side. See how I'm going to the side? See how he's stepping into me? Mm -hmm. I'm not pulling him. Remember last week we talked about leashes? Mm -hmm. The leash is to prevent the animal to leave, stop from leaving, and not to force him to stay with me. So what I've done was I stopped his position to go away from me and sidestep to his shoulder, and look at his front legs crisscrossing. Right. I am not pulling him. He is doing this on his own, and then the next shot uh, shows him coming in, and I'm backing up a little bit. Now he's hustling to catch up to me. And then we, the next shot shows him actually walking right with me. He's still not making contact, is he? No. But he's aware of where I am. And what I'm tapping into here is called alleomimatic behavior. Alleomimatic behavior is, means to mimic. It's Greek right. meaning to mimic. And fish school that way and, and birds flock that way. And that's what I'm doing here. And, and you watch two dogs, domestic dogs, who really like each other. They'll put their shoulders side by side and the tails will go up and they'll just kind of keep cruising right along with each other. And I'm tapping into this. Alleomimatic behavior means that the leader always knows where the followers are. So we're trying to get him to work with me. Because he's not a dog, I'm not going to get the same eye contact as I would if, um, if he was a purebred dog. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And the next picture, I believe, is the um, wolf. That's Shaitan at 10 months of age. Same one that I just did the agility with, but all of a sudden I put the leash on and look at the difference in the body posture. Tails down, heads turned away, doesn't want to make that connection. He stays outside. Um, I have the series of the pictures, but unfortunately they're in a frame, and I didn't scan them onto the computer. And what I've done was I keep turning my body away, and eventually Shaitan ends up directly beside me, the same way that the, the hybrid did. The difference is the tail never comes up. Oh. See the posture? Yeah. And the head never comes up. It's huh. uncomfortable for him to be there. But the reward was the chain went loose. So he self-rewarded by coming closer to me, then there was no more pressure on his neck. Now the chain is strictly to prevent him from leaving, not to force him to stay. I can't force this animal to do anything he doesn't want to do. Right. I just wanted you to see huh. by these pictures that, that um, wild animals, and he's a wild animal. He's not domesticated. 
You get that hybrid who's who's can't be kept in the house. He can't live in the house because he's is is a percentage of wolf breed in there that would just make him. You remember remember the pictures of Fleck running around the house? Can you imagine an animal that size doing the same thing? No. He'd be getting into everything. No. And how are you going to say no? He's going to jump up on the know. counter, you know. And you, how are you going to get him off? You can't force him. No. So they learn by their behaviors. They learn by their rewards, and they learn by lack of rewards. Coyotes again do the same thing. I want if we have um, we time. Gotta, we got to go to hazing. Okay. Um, do I have enough time to just talk about real quick thing that happened with some African elephants that yeah. were um, they were they were running out of food and so they had to call the animals out the herd out so they called out the big ones because they didn't have the ability this was in the 90s in South Africa they didn't have the ability to move the big bulls so what they did was they moved the juveniles and they moved them to a new location and shortly after they had been there within a year they were having rhino deaths. Rhino? Rhinos were being killed. And by doing the necropsies and looking where the, the, they see, could see tusk, tusk marks on top of the animals. When rhinos fight, the, the bites come from below. The, the tusk hit from below because that's the way they're shaped, right? Well, these animals were being killed from above. And these, these rogue elephants were running around. There's a bunch of juvenile elephants with totally out of control. The testosterone level was off the charts. They were being forced to reproduce earlier than they normally would in wild because there was no matriarch to take care of them. Nobody to show them the way. Matriarchs, very important in elephants. Absolutely. Yeah. So what they did was, the only solution they had was, uh, they tried having two females in there, but they couldn't. The numbers were too many for them to make. The, so what they did was they brought in some large, very large bull elephants. And all of a sudden, the youngs had to challenge the bull for reproducing rights, and they lost, and they were incapable of doing it, and testosterone level dropped, and violence dropped. Huh. So you have to have order. You only get order by having being taught by a, an elder. So um, hazing. I think we have a there. Oh, I see. We, oh, this is great. He he put this picture. This is Shatan. That you asked about. We talked about the the breathing. There's a series of three. Watch this great series of three shots take place. See if they go through one. There's the third one. He's greeting. I haven't seen him in seven years. And he remembered you. That's the greeting I got. Watch it. Oh, I love that. The <laughs> it still makes me laugh because it was like, I wasn't sure what to expect. And you can watch my face. <laughs> I went away for seven years, and that's the greeting I got. So did he remember me? Yeah. Can we prove it? We don't scientifically? No. But boy, oh, boy, picture says, you know. Yeah. A thousand words. Yeah. I hear you. So. I know it's you. You're there. Um, okay. Where's our hazing? The hazing attempt. Haz Here's hear. my yeah. hazing. I think we have, um, I believe that we were told that it will come up. It may not come up as accurate, but we can give the, the website so you can go to learn how to do proper hazing. Coyotes have to learn. There it is. Coyotes need to learn that being around humans is not always a safe place to be, but we don't have to hurt them. Mm-hmm. To, to stop them from being there. Yeah. All we need to do is what's called hazing. And hazing is stand your ground, make eye contact. Remember, they're learning from you. And we don't know if that's a juvenile watching us or a mature. A mature coyote will probably already know to stay away from us. A young juvenile who's coming up and, be, and finding the food and finding food source, they're going to keep coming back. So you stand your ground, you make eye contact, you advance, to, take one step towards. The, the, if you go to Project Coyote and, and go to their page and you can pull this up because not only will it tell you what to do, but it also tells you what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Yeah. And I think that's what's important. You don't have to go out of your way, but if you go out with your child and you see a, a, a coyote coming into your neighborhood, you have your child go in the house and you turn around and you make that animal feel unwelcomed. They're going to relate because that's what an adult coyote would do if you come near their den. They're going to try to make you unwelcome. And they're going to respect that and move away. Will they? Are we making this somebody else's problem? No, they'll go back to, they'll understand that coming here isn't 
with it. It's not worth the risk. I'll go back into the woods and hunt. I'll live in the woods. I'll come back out during the middle of the night when nobody else is around and scavenge if that's what I have to do to survive. But they won't come out in the middle of the daytime. Mm -hmm. They'll come out less and less. But if we kill but off the Do they come out in the daytime here? Well, some of the youngsters may um, if there's nobody to teach them the difference between right and wrong. Because remember when they're young, they go hunting with their parents. So they're going to go dawn to dusk. Okay. I never see them at, at daytime at, at, at my home. Um, uh, dusk time, I might see them in the field across the street from my house. I go out in the woods with my dogs every day. I go out in the woods and I see scats, so I know they're out there. I see the, I see the, prop, uh, the, the tracks. I hear them occasionally at nighttime, and I think it's a wonderful, personally, I think it's a wonderful sound. It's amazing because one coyote can sound like many. Mm -hmm. So you have a family, and it sounds like, oh, my God, we're being overrun. It's, no, it's just a way to make themselves bigger verbally, where an animal might make themselves bigger with the hackles going up. Yeah. These animals are being small That's as they I are. That's what I enjoyed about working out in, out in Yellowstone was listening, because I wasn't yes. where the wolves lived. Okay, yeah. It was at the Old Faithful, and you okay. could hear coyotes there. The coyotes at night is And amazing. especially the elk when the elk were breeding. Oh, Malone. Yeah. Yeah, they're not going to be able to take down the big elk, but will they take opportunities and find um, uh, the afterbirth baby? Yeah, sure. But um, sounds there is so much sure. to learn about coyotes that a, a, a short program like this would be really difficult. But if you look at your dog and you learn about your dog and and look at the coyote, they're just trying to survive the way we are, the way our dog is, the way our fellow. We're in more threat by our own dogs, our neighbor's dogs, our community dogs. In Franklin Park Zoo, way back, there were 13 deer killed. Not one were eaten. A pack of dogs get into the pen. Feral dogs? No, neighborhood dogs. Neighborhood dogs? Neighborhood dogs. People let their dogs out to play with their neighbors, right? And they got into the, into the park, and they get into the pen, saw the movement of the deer got all worked up into a frenzy, pack mentality kicks in, and the animals uh, got in there and they killed 13. We lost the whole herd. And oh. it's a shame. All because owners of these dogs didn't take responsibility and keep them in their backyard or take them out. If your dog needs exercise, go outside and play with them. That's one of the beauties of having a dog. If you have a stressful job, take five minutes, go out with your dog, Throw a ball for them, um, teach them to sit, teach them to lay down, teach them to, to go get another ball, and then call them back to you and toss a second ball in the other direction. You're exercising, you're stimulating the dog. Clients tell me all the time that when they leave my place, their dog is sound asleep in the car because we've challenged them mentally. Yeah. So just letting the dog out because you think that they have to get out and exercise isn't the same. Okay. That's it for today. We'll be back again next, next week. If you've got any questions that you'd like us to answer, would you please give us a call or email me at The Wandering Road, Biddeford. Well, I can't remember that. I'm sorry. I can't remember what, what we did on that. Call the station. We'll, we'll get your questions somehow, and we'll get you an answer next week. Uh, have a great day. Love and kisses.